Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and we're taking a look today at the new Lenovo IdeaPad 510S and this is the uh, first computer we've looked at this year that has the new uh, i7 KB Lake processor on board. This is the next generation Intel chip. We get a new one about every year. Uh, so this is the first one we're seeing here in that uh, category. So that should be a fun thing to explore. And this laptop also has a GPU on board. It's an AMD Radeon R7 M460. Not a very fast GPU as you'll see in the course of this review, but it'll be something else we can look at here as well. Now I do want to mention in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Lenovo. So we'll be sending this back when we're done with this. This review. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. All right, so let's get into the hardware first and then we will see how this thing performs. So it's got a screen that folds down almost flat to the table, so not quite, but uh, just about there. So you have some range on that. 14 inch display, 1920 by 1080. It's IPS, really decent viewing angles. Uh, Lenovo does put in some really nice displays even on their low and mid range devices. And this one uh, is no exception. It really looks very nice. i7 7500U processor at 2.7 gigahertz. I believe it's a dual core chip, kind of the lower powered i7, but uh, still performs quite well as you'll see. Now it has a auto switching graphics mode. So it has the new HD graphics 620 from the Intel uh, side of things built into that processor and it has that uh, AMD R7 M460 with two gigabytes of video RAM. But what's been interesting, you'll see this in the uh, benchmarks, is that uh, the internal graphics on the Intel side have been uh, improving over the years. And now we're at a point where this GPU doesn't really make all that much of a difference. It was kind of surprising. So you'll see some of that when we get into some of our benchmarks. Eight gigabytes of RAM and a 256 gigabyte SSD. And uh, you can upgrade the SSD and the RAM, but there is only a single RAM slot. It is DDR4, but it's running in single channel mode as a result, so that might impact its performance slightly, but uh, you can get in there and swap those out. The uh, SSD is just a standard uh, half-height SATA drive because some configurations of this computer uh, come with a terabyte spinning drive versus the SSD, but either way, uh, get the least expensive one you can afford and swap out that SSD later. Uh, very easy to do. There are a bunch of screws to undo on the bottom of the case here, but it is not hard to get at to do that upgrade. It weighs about 3.7 pounds or 1.7 kilograms, a little on the heavier side. Uh, but the price is uh, starting around $649 for this, and you can get it with an i5 uh, and that spinning hard drive and 8 gigs of RAM for that price. And uh, it doesn't come with the GPU at that price, but as you'll see, I think it might make sense to maybe consider that uh, given the performance increases we've seen on the graphics side of things from Intel. Now this one as configured is $849. That's because it's got the faster i7 CPU, it has the optional GPU, and they uh, configured it with the solid state drive. And I often recommend if you are buying a laptop these days, to get the solid state disk, even if it costs a little bit more. And the reason is, is that uh, on the spinning drives, even something as simple as just doing that uh, might be enough to damage your data on one of those spinning disks. So although you get less storage on the solid state drive, you get more performance and uh, some ruggedness because there are no moving parts uh, powering that drive. So just one thing to consider while you're shopping. On the side here, you've got a Kensington lock. You've got a, a power port here for the power adapter. It is a little large and ungainly as like we've seen on some of the other Lenovo devices lately, but uh, that's what it is, so plan accordingly on your uh, power strip. Over here, you've got a USB 2.0 port, so a little slower, but it provides non-stop power. So even if your uh, computer is shut off, you can charge your phone or tablet off of that. So that might be convenient for small spaces like a dorm or something. Uh, you get your headphone microphone jack here and a full-size SD card slot for downloading your pictures from your camera, although it does stick out quite a bit, so this will not be an augmented storage solution. On the other side here, let's flip it around, you've got uh, two USB 3.0 ports right here. There's no USB Type-C on this one. You got a full-size HDMI out and a unique thing here, you've got an uh, Ethernet jack. So if you want to plug directly into a network for better performance, uh, you can do that on there, which is very nice. Uh, the trackpad I am not crazy about. Very shallow click pad here, and it doesn't uh, do too well with multi-finger gestures. So for example, if I want to move this window around, I have to push down with one finger and move it. I'm of the habit of uh, pushing down with my thumb and then uh, trying to drag with my finger, but it doesn't work. So there's a few things on here that I'm not too crazy about on the trackpad, which is surprising because Lenovo typically has pretty nice trackpads. This one uh, does not fall into that category. Uh, the keyboard is good. It's backlit. There's just a white light, but it's backlit. Uh, my biggest gripe with this keyboard is one that I've had with other Lenovo keyboards in their mid-range devices, which is that the shift key is over here, and I keep hitting the arrow key when I'm trying to hit shift. And it's a, a muscle memory thing that I'll probably have to retrain myself on, but uh, this has been a problem for me in the past, and it still is now. Uh, it's a mixed bag. Some people write in saying, oh, you're just too hard on it. It's fine. I'm used to it. Other folks agree with me, so it's one of those 
those things. If you are uh, very uh, particular about your keyboards, you're not going to like the placement of that shift key, but otherwise it's a nice keyboard, decent travel on it, very comfortable to type on overall. So that is it for the hardware. Let's get this thing booted up with some stuff and see how it performs. All right, so let's start off with some web browsing. We should see good performance on that front, just given that we have an i7 processor. We'll load up my 1080p 60 frames per second video from my YouTube channel here and see uh, how well it holds up playing back that file. Sometimes that bogs some things down, but we'll go over here to our uh, stats for nerds and see how we're doing. You can see some of the issues I'm having with the click pad. I'm sometimes having to click one or two times to get it to uh, register what my intentions are, but uh, overall we're not seeing any drop frames and uh, things are performing very well on here, even in fast motion scenes. And that's to be expected given what we have for a processor on board. I'll go over to a website here and see how everything loads up on that front as well. We've got wireless AC built into this too. So uh, things here seem to load up very quickly and responsibly as I would expect it to on a, a brand new seventh generation i7 processor. Uh, the speakers are on the bottom of the device and uh, they sound okay. They're a little tinny to me, not a very good range of sound, but uh, good enough for web conferencing and that sort of thing. If you want to listen to music, I think you'll have a better experience if you plug in some headphones. And on the Octane benchmark test running in Google Chrome, we got a score of 34,302. That gives us an idea as to how well it might perform on uh, web applications. And that is a nice incremental improvement over last year's i7 processor, which you can see there on the Lenovo Yoga 900. Uh, that clocked in around 31,259. And now we're going to take a look at my Microsoft Word uh, test document here. This is our newsletter template. And as you can see here, it renders very quickly, even with two pages up on the screen. Uh, we can move things around and very quickly uh, get some work done. That's one of the advantages of getting the higher powered processors. There is a fan that you have to listen to occasionally on the computer, but uh, everything is a lot faster as a result. Uh, the larger processors, though, do consume a little more power. So uh, you're only going to get about five or six hours of battery life out of this uh, doing the basics and maybe some video watching. If you start playing games and whatnot, the battery will be a lot less than that. Speaking of games, let's check out some. We're going to start off with Minecraft, as we always do. So here we are in Minecraft. We're getting about 60 to 65 frames per second or thereabouts as we're moving through the world here. Some parts go a little faster, some go a little bit slower. I was expecting to see actually better performance given that there is a uh, discrete GPU on this device. And uh, the reason is, is that the GPU on here isn't all that fast. And I want to actually go to a benchmark first because I want to show you some other uh, more demanding games next. But uh, this benchmark will put some things in context. So this is from 3D Mark. It's their CloudGate benchmark that we run on all of our low end PCs. PCs. And on that test, I got a score of 5,626. Now, what's interesting, though, is that when I turn that GPU off, I got a score of 6,134. Now, it's really kind of interesting to see that there's not much of a difference here between uh, an add-on GPU and the actual internal Intel graphics. I don't think it speaks well for the GPU in that it could be a little more powerful, especially if you are paying extra for it. Uh, in the real world, however, uh, the results are slightly different. So we're going to take a look now at Grand Theft Auto V and see how it performs with the GPU and without the GPU. All right, so here we are playing Grand Theft Auto V. I've got the GPU uh, engaged right now. I'm really getting about 20 to 25 frames per second running at 1080p uh, with all of the settings turned way down. And it sometimes dips below that as uh, things get a little more complex. And what was surprising was, was that when I turned off the GPU and just ran it off the Intel graphics, it wasn't all that much slower. We were seeing speeds around 10 or 15 frames per second versus the 20 to 25 that we're getting uh, on it with the GPU engaged. So it really shows you how far Intel graphics have come, that they're really isn't that great of a disparity here uh, between a low-end discrete GPU on a laptop and uh, what Intel is now baking into their chips by default. So I think the GPUs on these devices definitely need to get better uh, to show you that there is some advantage to paying extra for getting them. Uh, so right now, I would not recommend this, first of all, as a gaming laptop, and I would actually recommend not getting the GPU at all. Let's take a look at Rocket League. All right, so here we are with Rocket League. I've got all the settings turned way down and uh, left the resolution at 1080p just to get a feel for what our best case scenario might be with the GPU. And it's pretty playable. We get about 45 to 50 frames per second, but the game is just ugly because all of those uh, effects are off. But you can play it uh, with the GPU at a pretty decent frame rate. But again, it's not all that much faster than the Intel graphics. So again, I, I don't think this is a very good gaming laptop to begin with. And uh, the GPU doesn't get you any closer to that either. So just keep that in mind. I think you could probably save some money if you are looking to buy this uh, by not putting that GPU on board. 
All right, so let's look at some video playback now. And I like to test really large and involved video files on these devices because if this stuff can work, uh, then your stuff will definitely work if you're getting things from Amazon or iTunes or Google or something like that. So uh, right now I'm running a, a movie that I extracted from a Blu-ray disc. There's no uh, Blu-ray player on this, but you can get the files off the disc using some uh, varying methods and uh, see how well it can hold up against some pretty large 1080p video files. And it's doing just fine with this. No drop frames, uh, perfect playback here, which is to be expected on a, a modern Intel device. But what really surprised me was that uh, this does well with uh, some newer formats, including uh, HEVC files that are recorded at 10-bit color. So this is a 140 megabits per second movie file, 4K. We're going to be uh, downsampling it to 1080p here as we're playing it back. But uh, this is playing back perfectly on here. We're not dropping any frames. It is a very, very smooth playback. Uh, these are test files that I downloaded from a site uh, called Jellyfish. I'll put a link down below in the uh, video description so you can get these as well because it's a great way to test how well your computer can hold up to uh, some of the most demanding multimedia out there. And this is a pretty demanding file that uh, often chokes many of the computers I test here on the channel. This one is playing it back perfectly and I think this is something that is new to the uh, Intel 7th generation architecture. So we're not always seeing huge performance gains on these Intel chips but they are building new things in that allow it to do more and this is a great example of that. So overall I think this is a decent laptop. I think at $650 for or the i5 version is probably a pretty good value for what you're getting here. You get a nice display, you get a good amount of RAM at eight gigabytes, and I think that i5 with the uh, new KB Lake architecture will be a, a good performing device for uh, the price. I think as you get closer to the $800 mark, especially with this one, uh, the value proposition isn't all there for me because we're not seeing any real performance out of this GPU that warrants spending extra for it. Uh, so I would like to see that on something like this, especially when you're getting into that price point. And although it is smaller than some of those $800 gaming laptops that Lenovo and others are putting out there, it doesn't perform anywhere nearly as good as those. So if you don't mind lugging around an extra pound of weight with you and you want that graphical performance, you can probably get in around the same price and get something that uh, will give you the graphics performance that you might want for gaming and perhaps for some video editing and other things. So again, at the low end, I think it's a pretty good mid-range laptop, uh, but I wouldn't spend more than $700 for it. I think if you got the i7 with the Intel graphics, you have a decent performing laptop that uh, will do a lot of decent productivity work along with video editing and some other things. But uh, again, uh, not recommended when you get above 800 bucks. This is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.